Good afternoon, everyone. So let's talk about innovation. Innovation requires imagination. So please allow me to reimagine our Lithuanian history. What if Lithuania has been a startup all along? Fasten your seat belts. Switch your phones to flight mode, because we're about to do a little time travel to explore the fundamental concept of Lithuania as a startup and look at innovation that is at the very heart of our country and at the core. As a matter of fact, yesterday, Vice Minister Karolis said that innovation is in Lithuanians' DNA. So let's get right into the question. Who are Lithuania's earliest innovators? I give you Mindaugas. Lithuania's only king, who was a talented politician and a great warrior, he devised a business strategy to unite Lithuania. How did he do this? Well, he pitched his idea to the chief venture capitalist at the time, who was the Pope. Though pagan, Mindaugas, his family, and other nobility got baptized in a very diplomatic move in order to take power away from the enemy, and in return, he was granted powers, lands, and securities by the Pope. So thus, July 6, 1253, upon his official coronation, Lithuania became a full-fledged, internationally recognized European nation. However, Lithuania was a new country in an oversaturated red ocean kind of market. We had a lot of catching up to do with our European competition. Silicon Valley, by the way, wasn't even close to being discovered then because Columbus only sailed that ocean blue in 1492. Mindaugas invited an environment of tolerance, one where pagans and Christians could live together. Ironically, he was murdered by a pagan who was not thrilled about the whole Christianity stunt. But even after his death, the legacy he left behind was a united Lithuania. Yo, Minda! A few decades later, we had Gediminas. Grand Duke Gediminas came to power. He was a tolerant pagan living in semi-pagan lands. He not only tolerated other religions and peoples, but he invited them through famous letters, to come and work and live in Lithuania. The Jewish community prospered at this time. He was a visionary and a founder of Vilnius. He had a dream of an ironclad wolf on a hill, howling like you've never heard before. A dream interpreter said, that is where a great city will be built. And it's built here, right, starting right at the corner of where the Vilnala and the Nedis meet. So, in 1323, he sends seven letters in longhand, because Slack, X, and Twitter weren't available then, to various recipients across Europe, including the Pope. He knew to build Lithuania strong and free, he needed to build it with people. So in one letter, he invited knights. Who were your VCs back then? He invited squires and merchants. These are your business development types. Doctors, smiths, cobblers, millers. These are the engineers and scientists back then. And others to come and practice their trade here. Basically, today's startup people like you, the builders. So Gediminas was already laying the foundation for the startup ecosystem, which we can cherish today. Oh, and his economic policy, by the way, was way better than our Finmans today. Okay, just kidding. Or am I? Peasants were offered tax exemptions for 10 years. The merchants were also exempt from taxes and tariffs. So, truly a pretty brilliant move by a very forward thinker. Lightsabers and all. Fast forward some years, and we have Vitotas, the Great, an important figure in Lithuanian national rebirth. He helped build a national consciousness. He also beefed up his National Security Council with some international advisors. At the time, the management coaches said that was the right thing to do. So in 1397, he brought the Tatars to Lithuania, where they settled not too far from here, around Trakai. They came to strengthen the military forces, and in exchange, they received lands for their service. 
Later, these people became craftsmen and gardeners and lived and practiced their culture freely and their religion freely to this day. Oh, and did they deliver. Their cutting-edge, state-of-the-art, out-of-the-box thinking was a critical element in a genius warfare move to win the Battle of Grunwald, otherwise known as Jalgeromusches. This was the true rise of Lithuania's Miltek, a pretty good historical narrative so far. Part two of my keynote is not so jubilant, so bear with me. Fast forward a few centuries, and you have a Russian-occupied, exhausted country. A country that never gave up hope and vision to be free once again. In the midst of these grim realities, many stories stand out, like the partisans who fought the longest underground resistance movement in Europe. I don't talk lightly about this, but if you think about it, the people who persevered throughout occupation and brought about Lithuanian independence used a lot of the same tactics that we expect today's founders to use when building Lithuanian startups, scaling them internationally, and disrupting how the world works. The word founder has a philosophical meaning. It's someone who envisions an idea and executes it into being. Americans are proud of their founding fathers. We are proud of ours. And every founder in our ecosystem should remember that they're bearing a title that mandates them to build so much more than just their own startup. So the grand vision behind it all at the time was independence, full stop, and the whole ecosystem shared in that mission. It's really startup mentality. But there's one story, one story I'd really, really like to highlight. And I learned of it recently. It's that of an underground printing press just outside of Kaunas. This thing is amazing. It's truly, truly a remarkable story of courage, determination, and innovation. This printing press that you see right here was built with little money, passionate belief from scratch, required a lot of patience and dedication, and it took years and years to build. Once built, it scaled so fast. This was the ultimate startup. The founder working in stealth mode in lockstep with the only person he trusted most in the world, his co-founder, in this case, his wife. They knew the huge risk they were taking. To print, distribute, or read prohibited books, one could be tortured, jailed, executed, exiled to Siberia, or confined to a madhouse. Take your pick. Talk about operating in a highly regulated environment. But in their heart of hearts, they knew it had to be done to keep the flame of truth alive in the hearts and minds of the people. They loathed the oppressors and the status quo. At its height, the printing press would print 1,000 pages an hour. They would distribute the patriotic resistance literature via a network, the Catholic Church. It was a perfect operation. They worked day and night to bootstrap. They squeezed every drop out of the supplies they got their hands on. And they made a huge, huge impact. Don't believe me? I encourage you to all go see it. And by the way, it's outstanding that his wife to this day is still running tours of this place. But what am I really trying to stress here? Lithuania gaining independence is the ultimate case of positive disruption. In 1990, Lithuania strives to gain independence with peaceful songs, poems, protests, forming the largest human chain across the Baltics. Once the brutal Soviet blockade was over and full independence was restored, we started building relentlessly and getting rid of legacy systems and finding allies. Do you remember how fast we couldn't find ladas in the streets anymore? People were changing those things like nobody's tomorrow. How did this happen? In 1990, we already had the culture of serial entrepreneurship. So brave men and women got to work building both the infrastructure and the connectivity to the West. You might not think about this in these terms, 
But only nine months after the tragic accidents of January 13, 1991, Lithuania was connected to the internet, thanks to our friends in Norway. In 2004, we became members of both NATO and EU. In 2008, communication specialists came up with the slogan, Lithuania, a brave country. This was to give us an easily recognizable identity. But at the time, people were kind of skeptical. Come on, brave? But today, that label is ingrained in each and every one of us. And there are examples ranging from accommodating Belarus opposition right here to setting up the Taiwanese representative office. And I recently learned that people actually travel from far away to take pictures by the plaque at the Taiwanese representative office. And then also, of course, all the work that we've done with Ukraine, welcoming Ukrainian refugees, organizing humanitarian aid, and raising funds to support the Ukrainian military at record levels. NATO and EU were not the only stakeholders, though. Western service centers started to find their place in Lithuania as well in the early 2000s. Sweden's Transcom brought such companies like Delta Airlines customer service and, and registration right here. Then after that came Barclays, CSC, Western Union, and others. This gave us strong communication ties and skills with the West. We learned the art of great customer service, empathy, effective conflict resolution, and problem solving. We were praised for our achievements, and finally, 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 we figured out our country's product market fit in the world. Who are we? We are fast, strong, efficient, courageous, great communicators, unafraid to take leadership positions, and we are everywhere. Just try to go anywhere and not meet a Lithuanian. So we have these incredibly powerful networks of brilliant people at the top of their game in all corners of the world. Case in point, this photo on a remote island on a random small beach, wherever we go, there we are. On the real, though, the Lithuanian diaspora is the fuel for our international growth, so let's not forget to use it. And at this point, I'd like to shout out Apolinaras Sinkavichus, who has brought great international venture capitalists to Lithuania to form ties here, and they're already investing. So even one person makes a huge difference. Skip ahead to today, and we're in full scale up mode. The European Commission published a European Innovation Scoreboard in 2024, and Lithuania is at the highest level of development in history, beating out the average in Europe by a long shot. So this is the time and the place to come build your company. Today, we're number 35 in the world for innovation, but wouldn't it be great to catapult Lithuania to the top of the list? To do this, we need to understand that the future is ours, each and every one of us sitting here and beyond. We all play a role in developing this story further. We need to vibrate at an even higher level, and we can. This year, those under the age of 30 reached happiest in the world. Happiest in the world. What does that give us? Opportunity. Positivity breeds confidence. Confidence breeds the right attitude to create, learn, dream, take risks, aim for the moon. Why not? We are standing on the shoulders of happy giants. In scale-up phase, we are at an inflection point, ready, willing, and able to build the small country into the biggest, most exceptional innovation ecosystem. From a universal perspective, we all live on the same pale blue dot that Voyager 1 infamously photographed 34 years ago. Carl Sagan and his wife said, look at that blue dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. Everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who has ever lived out their lives, it's truly a poetic and historic, holistic view of Earth, quoted from their book. Today, we have Lithuanian biotech innovation preparing to board the International Space Station for highly sophisticated experiments. You know, in science, you start with a premise, and then you set up an experiment to prove the premise. 
Let's become the country of the future. Think of it. In a few short years, we created an entire defense tech sector here from scratch. We've also attracted some of the biggest players in the world and international recognition from the largest space tech powerhouse organizations. How do we scale in this world today, but not only maintain magnificent momentum, but improve our velocity? I want to talk about another field where we're also excelling, and that's the arts. So this is Nicole Jaraitis, who maybe many don't know, but she's American-Lithuanian and won Grammy this year for Best Jazz Album. So we're a week away from parliamentary elections. It's time of democratic renewal for our country. And we, the Lithuanian tech sector, are the driving force of our nation. And we have the responsibility not only to vote, but to serve. In every moment of historic transition, technologists, innovators, and visionaries have played their part. After the elections, we have to serve again, infusing our expertise into the government's agenda and offering our experience to ministers new and old. If there's one message I'd like you to take home, the positive lessons from history can help us remember we've done this many times before. Now we can again scale this startup called Lithuania and truly reshape the world for the better. If we strive for constant and never-ending improvement every day, day by day, little by little, then in the summer of 2026, when Europe's top investors come to Vilnius for the European Business Angel Network Congress, they will convert to being the happiest partners of Startup Lithuania, the happy, brave, industrious nation with lessons and great examples for the whole world. Thank you very much.